What is wildlife conservation? I used to think it was simply about preserving wild animals and birds in their natural habitat. Sounds about right, right? Well, I was obviously very naive and forgot about money. Ever since we humans have put a price tag on the head, tail, fur, feathers, skin, horns, tusks, and other body parts of most living creatures we share the planet with, wildlife conservation seems to have more to do with business, money and profits, than the well-being of wildlife itself. But before I wind myself down into a dark place, let me focus on what I planned on sharing with you, namely three insights Russ and I have learned from three very different wildlife conservationists we've had the privilege of meeting. They are Jörg, Patrick and Vincent. Let me start with Jörg Olsen with Jokani. Jokani is a big cat sanctuary where white lions have been saved from canned hunts, tawny lions rescued from illegal owners, and caracals from being shot by irate farmers. Although Jörg readily admits that being kept in enclosures is not ideal, these cats are safe and well cared for. Because Jörg believes in education so strongly, and because these animals can never be released, visitors are allowed, even encouraged, to come and fall in love with these big cats. Jörg tells each animal story, and no one leaves without being very clear that captive breeding is bad news for lions. My innings basically over. We can't allow to have our numbers and our cats declining, but we've got to go and look at a place like this. They must be still a neat place in the wild, and it's all about education. Right, we're going to go. Are you ready to take your turn at bat? To take the baton and run your leg? The second wildlife conservationist I want to introduce you to is Patrick, the park manager of the Infolozi Game Reserve. In South Africa, under the apartheid regime, fences were put up to keep animals in and people out of the game reserves. Entire local communities were relocated. These people had and saw no benefits from having wildlife living across the fence. They could not enter, as game reserve visitors were primarily white, rich, and came from far away. When poaching expanded from being merely food for the pot to a lucrative income proposition, locals were naturally enticed to participate. They felt it was their turn to benefit from the wildlife that lived next door. Over the years, the new management of the Infolozi and its sister Park Shishlui have made changes that create incentives for the local communities to be protectors and informants instead of poachers. Managers like Patrick have helped people think bigger. If poaching is not stopped, all the animals will be gone. He taught them something well, what, what, else what rather that, profound. People don't think as, as you are thinking in a, in, a, in a conservation management. Other people think that, no, 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 these animals are here and then they, they give birth uh, every year and oh. then well, what, well, what's going to happen? These, these animals will always be here. Okay. But as, 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 as we, we are in, in a conservation, we're not thinking about infolosis only. We're thinking about other areas which doesn't have these animals, but who, who got a, 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 a potential to hold these animals. That's why if the animals, uh, if the game here increases and then they reach cap carrying capacity, we move rhinos to other areas where they, they, are, not, they, are, they are not there or they are, they, there's a small population. Let's move on to our third remarkable wildlife conservationist. Vincent Barkas from Track. What I don't understand is you call For years, Vincent has trained anti-poaching rangers. His passion is protecting wildlife from the bad guys and training up skilled rangers to get the job done. Over the past few years, the playing field has changed and it has become an outright war zone out there in the bush. Literally a battle to save, in particular the rhino, from the increasingly more sophisticated syndicate paid poacher. As any army general does, Vincent has tried to understand the enemy. By doing so, he found something much larger and more challenging than I ever realized. What you've got to understand as well, the, the, the rhino poaching is killing our local communities because it's starting false economies. It's causing prostitution. Yeah, well, well, the guy, you've got a relatively, a guy who doesn't 
who might earn 3,000 rand a month, let's say for example. Okay. He goes and shoots a rhino, he now gets 800,000 rand cash. Is that how much they get? They can get up to that much. They'll split that between three or four of them. Okay. Okay, but he's got a large quantity of money now. Let's say it's, he's lands up with 250,000 rand. That's a huge he amount of money. Buys a car, gets it, rigs up his house a bit better. But now that infrastructure all costs money. Okay. He's got nice clothes, so all the women are there with him. He starts abusing alcohol, he starts abusing drugs, prostitution comes on board, and then his money runs out quickly. So he's got to go back. And it's this false economy they start. You know what I mean? Mm. And, and it's destroying our local communities. You go speak to some of the Indunas there, you would have seen it too. But it's making gangsters out of a guy that would go and put a snare and catch an impala. It's largely up to the government to sort out this huge poaching crisis. However, in the meantime, it's up to people like Vincent to continue the daily ground war to protect rhino, elephant and other wildlife species from the ever-growing number of poachers. What a privilege it is to meet people like Jörg, Patrick and Vincent, who do good for Africa's wildlife every day.